Hi, and welcome to the Driving Your Business vlogcast. I'm Adam Mackay from AdWords Work, presenting this week's episode. Driving Your Business is all about interviewing successful business owners who've been in their game for a relatively long period of time. The aim is to find out what's behind their long-term success. How have they handled the ups and downs of being in business and what motivates them to continue? Now, we will share these episodes each week on YouTube, so pop a comment below if you would like to be interviewed or if you know a business owner who you think we should interview. This week's guest is Sanjay Shah. Sanjay heads up Visionary Digital Studios and runs an animation agency. Uh, Sanjay first started his business a bit over five years ago, and we wanted to interview him because he has what we think is quite a unique setup. He has a truly remote global workforce and the way he manages his staff and his projects we think is probably going to be a bit shocking to traditional business owners who are still stuffing their employees into offices nine to five Monday to Friday. So let's get straight into the interview with Sanjay and find out what's behind his success, uh, share some of his secrets to uh, running a business without ever having to physically meet his staff. So welcome Sanjay Shah from Visionary Digital Studios. Thank you, Adam, pumped to be here. So let's just uh, get a quick rundown on your business um, and your background. So uh, tell us 20, 30 seconds, uh, you know, a little bit of your uh, personal and business background and then give us a 10 second, like typical elevator pitch, uh, just flat out 10 seconds, what you do, who you work with, what benefits you offer to them. Nice. So I started Visionary Digital Studios five years ago now. I was uh, climbing the corporate ladder in the, in the corporate world uh, and had pretty much reached the end of the line there. Um, so I started a marketing agency. Um, we specialize in videos. Uh, and then based off those videos, we produce all sorts of digital marketing strategies for clients. So we're five years into business now, I'm starting to work with bigger clients and uh, much more detailed campaigns. So when it comes to an elevator pitch, um, we're helping tech CEOs, tech companies make international impact by, uh, by producing scalable messages through video and digital marketing. Very good. I think that was actually less than 10 seconds. Nice. Two seconds to spare. And you called yourself a video marketing company, but um, you've often said to me, you're a cartoon company. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so it depends. If I'm, uh, if I'm in the bar and introducing myself, I'll be saying that I run a cartoon company because I think that's just fun and cool. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're a digital agency. In essence, um, we're running digital marketing campaigns for big international companies, but you know, um, no one needs to hear that when we're out in a social situation. <laughs> now, I've always thought the cartoon company sounded really cool. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you told me that. So um, certainly if I ever meet a girl, I'm saying uh, I run a cartoon company. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you started five years ago. Um, yeah. So uh, tell us honestly, did you write a business plan before you started the business? Definitely not. Definitely not. So uh, I had a vision, certainly. Um, I always have a vision in mind. Um, I certainly have a plan going forward for one month, three months, a year, five years, even 10 years. Uh, but in my, in my eyes, business plans, ridiculous. Uh, in such a fast moving world, such a fast moving industry, um, business plans just a waste of time in my opinion. So you haven't done one since uh, that you sort of go back to an update on a yearly basis or do you sort of work on the, like the company vision statement every, every year or so? Exactly that. Yeah. So I've got a page long vision statement that I'm always working on, um, reading it through it every day, always crafting that, but definitely not the type of business plan that you would have coming out of a university course. Okay. So you're reading your vision statement on a daily basis. Definitely, yeah, priming my mindset. So I've got a, um, a visionary digital studios vision statement, but then I've also got a personal vision statement as well. Uh, really, like, really important for me personally to read that to start it every day so I'm primed for knowing what, what the right decisions are to make and what the right actions are to take to get to 
the vision for the company, right? Rather than just kind of um, doing anything anywhere. Yeah, that's interesting because so many people before us, um, you know, great thinkers and, and business people have always um, written down their goals and uh, some have even, you know, said that it's great practice to read your goals uh, out loud to yourself at the start of every day, for instance, to keep yourself on track and make sure you're working towards achieving them. Totally, totally. Almost all of the great business people I know have some form of that art in their life, whether it be uh, writing down goals, the old Grant Cardone, write your, write your goals down when you get up, when you go to sleep, or um, you know, reading through a vision statement, mission statement, um, having vision boards, that sort of thing, uh, so pervasive amongst the successful business owners that I know. Yeah. So who are those kind of thought leaders that you, you know, take inspiration and learnings from? I, I'm always in a mastermind is my thing uh, where I really kind of um, work on my business knowledge. So even when I first started, I um, started visionary through a mastermind. The idea was um, this guy called Timothy Mark, shout out to him if he's watching. He was my first mentor. He had about a hundred people in his course. He t taught us all to build businesses from scratch. So that was very early days. These days um, in the mastermind. So a mastermind called the mastermind. Um, my mentor is Ben Simpkin. Shout out to him uh, again. So just make sure that my knowledge is kept cutting edge at all times. Make sure that the people around me are also um, really kind of visionary business owners reaching up. So it kind of uh, sets a standard, sets a bar, but also uh, Ben, Ben's known as the number one Facebook marketer in the world right now. So um, I know that if I'm learning from him, then uh, my knowledge is as good as anyone else's in the market. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great idea surrounding yourself with um, successful people in, uh, in similar industries or in other industries, but, uh, but learning from people who have you know, been there and done that is, is so important, isn't it? So much so. I mean, uh, this is so this is so important for me. Um, your net worth, your network is your net worth, right? Is a, a common mastermind saying. Um, and so, even my friends, obviously, me and you are really close friends, right? Uh, we, we I, I make sure that my friends are very, very uh, intelligent kind of business owners, or um, have a an intelligence quality that um, makes sure that I'm, you know, constantly lifted up by them. So, yeah. Oh, you must have some pretty amazing people around you if, uh, if I'm the starting point. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to slip in a little compliment for you there. You got to work with me. Oh, uh, goodness. Um, so tell us about your workforce because um, I'm kind of always in awe of how you've got like a global workforce. Um, your people are all over the place. Uh, tell us about some of the countries they're in um, uh, and just tell us how you, you know, manage the people and, and the projects because I think there's a lot of traditional business owners out there who, you know, um, they stick people in an office nine to five, Monday to Friday and don't believe that there's any other possible way. But, you know, you're kind of proving that you can run a business without having a fixed office and uh, without having people working traditional hours. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely, I guess, in this age, the... Um, the workforce, the talent pool is essentially global. Uh, and there's all sorts of tools out there, all sorts of um, platforms that you can get the best talent in the world to work on your projects, um, which is really important for us. So when it comes to communication or giving client experiences, we'll generally have people here in Australia um, because they understand the culture of most of our clients. They're able to uh, kind of really communicate on that personal level. Yeah. But when it comes to technical skills, I can hire people that uh, have a lifetime worth of experience and I can bring those skills from overseas countries. A lot of our teams based in India, We've got a couple in the Philippines, um, got a couple in the States even. So <clears throat> I can bring those skills into our projects and it can be people with a lifetime worth of experience that I can bring them in at a budget that our clients can afford, which is really powerful. Yeah. So you're sort of opening yourself up to, you know, a talent pool that uh, if you're only employing in, you know, your suburb or your city, um, you're kind of restricting yourself in a way, but you're opening yourself up to a talent pool that's totally global. 
So much so, yeah. So um, when we do animations is a great example. Uh, I can hire someone, uh, an animator from here, somewhere in Queensland, for example, uh, that has a few years of experience and I can bring them in to our projects and our clients will be happy with their work. Or I can find someone in India who's got a lifetime worth of experience, whose passion and purpose is to do motion graphics and animation. I can bring them into the project and I can serve that client much better for that same budget. Yeah, interesting. I guess that's um, something that a lot of people aren't going to um, be able to get their, their head around. Uh, and a lot of people aren't going to agree with it because they want to you know, employ people locally on the ground here. And I think whatever works for your business at the end of the day is, is cool. I, I mean, I tend to agree. Uh, every, like, I've seen, certainly seen many people do it really well um, with local teams and that's cool. Um, I think the trend in business in general now is going towards uh, everyone needs to have a global talent pool. Even if you're a local company, even if you're a small local business, having a VA that works for you full time from the Philippines who can make life easier for all of your local staff, for example, um, will be very powerful. And I think it's starting to get to the point where if you don't have that skill set of bringing in foreign, foreign staff and then managing them really well, making them happy, ha allowing them to do their best work in your clients' projects, if you don't have that skill set, it's very difficult to compete with other, I guess, more modern businesses that are able to do that. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Um, I guess, you know, you're not uh, employing offshore solely for the purpose of reducing operating costs, but to be able to add, you know, skill sets and, and add new people to your workforce that can benefit, you know, your clients at the end of the day. Definitely, man. That, that is such a good point. Like, so that's what's happened with outsourcing. Maybe um, five years ago, which is a long time in digital industries, five years ago, outsourcing was just a way to get work done cheaply and then give it to a client who didn't know any better and you could make profit. But the world's changed so much now. Outsourcing isn't about that anymore. It can be about that, sure, but outsourcing can now also be about really dominating your industry or being able to bring in skill sets that are just mind blowing for your industry because you're able to leverage different currencies, different skill sets. And you know what? Different cultures have different talents as well. So um, when we're talking about staff in India, for example, um, perhaps their communication in the Western world isn't great, but their technical skill sets are, are just mind boggling compared to what we can do here in Australia. But in Australia, um, perhaps our work ethic, our attention to detail, our attention to quality is is much better. So if we can combine a project manager in Australia to bring those communication and quality skills and we can provide and we can bring in team members from India to bring that technical skill set, you can create a bit of a utopia. Yeah, awesome. I don't know about the uh, the work ethic uh, being that much better in Australia, having <laughs> employed a lot of people in Australia, uh, you've got to choose wisely to, to get the work ethic that you uh, really need but uh, yeah so true so true uh, New Zealand's looking at going to a four day a week uh, working week aren't they I saw that in the news this week I did hear about that I did hear about that interesting to see how that's going to work given that most people don't even work a five day work week like there's, <laughs> it's very rare that professionals are working only 40 hours a week these days yeah it's probably hard for people like you and I to imagine because I think you work eight days a week and uh, <laughs> <laughs> as well uh 25 hours a day i'm subconsciously working in my sleep i'm, I'm making business plans in my sleep yeah that's that's how you get ahead <laughs> um, all right so tell us um what's the uh the biggest i don't want to say mistake what's the biggest learning moment you've had so far in your business i like it uh i mean it's i'm gonna say it's a constant it's a constant this, but it's being too hard on myself. Uh, I kind of, it's been maybe even in the last year, I've really become self-aware of this, but I've always been really, really hard on myself. Uh, if something's not going right in business, I'm my, it's running through my mind. I'm a failure. What am I doing? Why am I letting people down? All that sort of thing. Um, but I've realized in the last year, especially that if you're evolving in any, in any field, but in business, if you're evolving, especially if you're evolving really quickly, then, um, Failure is 
part of the journey. The challenge is part of the journey. Things not going right is part of the journey. It's like it can't, it can't be any other way. So the options are don't fail at all and just don't evolve or fail but evolve. So the biggest mistake in that regards is that uh, I've been, just been really hard on myself and that then saps my energy. It saps my mindset. It means I, I can't give as much to my team, to our clients, to our business. Uh, so focused a lot on that in the last six months just to chill out. You know, if, if something goes wrong, um, I'm the first one to be on the phone to um, the team member or the client or anyone and um, saying, sorry, this is how we're going to fix it. But just not being so stressed about it, not having it run through my mindset. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like business owners and entrepreneurs are either um, that way inclined, uh, like inclined to beat themselves up on a daily basis and uh, be very self-critical um, mm -hmm. or they're massive egos and uh, they are the greatest living thing that's ever existed on the planet, uh, full stop. Um, doesn't seem like there's much in between. It's, it's either <laughs> ego or self-criticism. Yep, I would agree. It's it's like very rare. I think every uh, every business owner understands this, but it's very rare. Sometimes you meet another business owner who just exudes calm and has everything under control. And even when something goes wrong, you just you just feel that they're going to have everything under control. Uh, it's a very rare thing, but um, yeah, man, that's where I want to be. Yeah, yeah, being uh, cool and calm and confident. Yeah, love it. So we've been going through a. Uh, a you know, changing economic climate over the last couple of months. Um, it's not something that you would have been, you know, predicting or, uh, or sort of working towards, but did you have like risk aversion and risk management um, practices in place uh, for this sort of thing potentially happening? Yes. Um, personally, I'm going to say, uh, I don't know if this is egotistical, but I'll just say it because it's the truth. Uh, I have been planning for this and I was expecting something like this, um, not specifically coronavirus. Um, my feeling, uh, a lot of people disagree with me, so you, you got to take this with a grain of salt, but my feeling was the fundamentals of the economy were all prepared, were ready for some sort of crash to happen, um, probably over the last year or two, to be honest. Plenty of people have been talking about it. Um, it's not in the mainstream media, obviously. Um, but I've been preparing for this personally for a long time, um, just keeping a lot of cash in the business, not taking risks, that sort of thing. Uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, for the last couple of years, I've been preparing and I guess I've been wrong at the last couple of years because nothing's happened. So I, I understand that um, I'm not 100% right here. But when this happened, I wasn't actually surprised. I just I was surprised about coronavirus, but I wasn't surprised that everything's crashed and fallen to pieces. Um, so I think the key is education. I think when I started really learning about the economy a few years ago, understanding um, the, the dynamics of power and finance that happen in the world, how wealth is almost intentionally transferred from the poor to the rich, um, the corruption in the economic system. I won't get too deep into this, but when I started learning a lot about that, um, I, I guess I started being able to make decisions uh, that, that accommodated the possibility of something like this happening. Yeah. And so keeping cash in the business, that's been a big part of um, you know, your risk aversion strategy or keeping more cash than you normally would, I guess? Yeah, um, definitely that. So um, keeping more cash when probably I could have spent it on staff and, you know, marketing campaigns and things like that. But I kept a lot of cash in the biz. Um, a really big thing for us was maybe three years ago, we were just a video company. We did nothing but videos. Um, so over those last few years, we've really worked hard on diversifying our services as well. So that um, it's, it's kind of our industry is getting... Um, very crowded in terms of people developing videos. So uh, to to get through that, I've kind of uh, added a lot more services to our portfolio so that once we get a client in, they're always delighted with their video. It's a great product. Just It's just a cool product. So once we've done that video project, then we can serve them in lots of other different ways in that digital marketing field, which um, is, a, is a good 
risk mitigation mitigation strategy for us because like once we got the client in then we know that they're going to come be coming back to us for the next few years yeah so kind of um bringing in different income streams um from diversified products and services i love that yeah exactly that bringing different income streams i'm really glad i did that as well because especially over the last year or two i actually think there's someone running a training course in how to build animated video companies which is what we which was practically all we did a few years ago so it's getting to the stage where there's just people doing this everywhere but there is no one to my knowledge or very very few companies that are able to develop animated explainer videos like we do and then also deliver that full suite of digital marketing well yeah yeah okay so when it comes to you know managing risks in times like this um diversifying your services and keeping cash seem like two relatively basic but intelligent things to do uh mm -hmm. things that a lot of very successful companies have done to be able to weather storms through you know this or the gfc or the tech bubble or whatever in the past why do you think so many businesses don't do it because we've got a lot of businesses right now in in australia and a lot of other countries that um you know i guess are relying on government handouts literally to survive uh, and some might not even survive despite the, the government handouts going on uh, why do you think business owners don't um you know think about those sort of preparations i, I think it's education um i think that i guess a few months ago uh the tv was telling everyone that the economy was spectacular everything's going to be great everything's always going to be great in fact the tv always says that right so i feel like sure. uh business owners weren't really prepared uh for anything going wrong and we're just assuming that this uh this beautiful run that we've had will continue forever so i think um that's probably the key in my opinion just education understanding the financial system even if you're not in finance if you're running a business in this age then what's happening in global economies is going to affect your business because most businesses are in some way or the other international these days yeah yeah okay cool that's one of those things that's um it's always been very important to me uh is how you manage you know future risk this that you can't see just yet um and always being prepared for for that future risk that you can't see and i'd love to see more business owners you know putting a little bit of thought into you know what if shit happens down the track what am i going to do how am i going to be prepared for it um hopefully these sort of things um you know can help get that message across to more people and, and help educate more people Yep, totally agree. You actually taught me a lot about this. Um, your mindsets, uh, a lot of these are a lot of your mindsets that I'm um, talking about right now. It comes back to my other point before of having the right people around you and having conversations with other intelligent business owners. Um, certainly, that multiple streams of income um, is something that you taught me about a lot. Okay, so let's get into some uh, marketing-related questions. Uh, this is probably a tough one, but what's the most successful marketing strategy you've employed so far? So the, the one thing that has worked the best for your business, whether it be for generating leads or closing leads into sales, um, branding. Nice. Uh, not difficult at all. I'm going to say it's uh, our content marketing strategy, um, which was surprising. It wasn't intended to be uh, the most powerful, but it's, it's been amazingly powerful. So uh, what we did is produced uh, it's over a couple of years, we produced about say 50 to 70 pieces of content. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're using a scheduler called Hootsuite software uh, to schedule that all over social media. Um, and what, what I found is over, uh, we've been doing this now for a good 18 months and perhaps over the last six months to a year, um, we're, we're starting to attract people who believe exactly what we believe. So the pieces of content um, very much designed around our target audience and their mindsets, their beliefs, their pain points, uh, which is also my mindsets, my pain points, my beliefs. Uh, so very, very authentic content, um, really well crafted, really relevant for the audience. Uh, 
And then, yeah, we've got about 50 to 70 of those pieces every day that gets scheduled on every social media platform. Uh, and what I've found is that now our exact target market tends to be attracted to us and almost sells themselves. So by the time, by the time they get on the call, they're already ready to work with us. Whereas um, if I get leads through our Facebook ads campaigns or through any of our other paid advertising campaigns, the prospects aren't really ready. We have to nurture them a lot. It takes a long time to sell them. Uh, but yeah, that content has been really powerful. Then when we've got current customers, they're also connected to our social media. So they're seeing our content every day. So it makes it, it makes them um, trust us. It makes them want to buy more from us. It's, we don't, we don't need to sell them. They are selling themselves. So by the end of the project, they are asking us, what else can we do with you guys? Uh, because they're already very much indoctrinated in our beliefs and our strategies. Uh, the content is essentially educating them the whole way. Yeah. Okay. So just for those people who might be listening or watching this, um, you know, saying something like a content marketing strategy might not make any sense to them. Um, you're literally putting out like blog articles that you guys write uh, and post on your website and on platforms like LinkedIn, but then you're also creating like image posts uh, to use on Facebook, for instance, but then you sort of write stories that go with those images on Facebook for each post as well, right? Yes, exactly. So it doesn't really need to be super complicated. Uh, it might've sounded complicated the way I described it, but for most businesses, right. um, I think if you, if you write say five to 10 lines of copy um, about a particular pain point your target audience has or a particular value they might have, a particular benefit they might want, um, include a picture, an image with that, um, that's one piece of content. So over a weekend, most business owners, it might take you um, the whole weekend, but you could produce 50 to 70 of those pieces of content without too much uh, research because most directors have that knowledge already inside them. So you just need to work out what your 50 to 70 topics are, um, write that content as quickly as you can. Then once you've got that, you can put that into a spreadsheet uh, and then you can have one of your staff uh, schedule that using Hootsuite. Hootsuite's really good. Like, so you can schedule that post across five different social media platforms and you can schedule all those posts. We do it three months in advance. So um, not too much work. I guess the majority of the work is just that weekend where you got to sit down and like put all of the content that's in your head out onto paper, hypothetically speaking. Um, but yeah, once you've, once you've done that, then you have this content marketing machine that's always educating everyone in your audience, always indoctrinating your audience. Um, the reason that's so powerful, obviously it's great to bring in new leads. It's great to also um, have your customers coming back to you. You're always at the top of, your, top of mind. But yeah. also if you've got a prospect in your pipeline, if they're seeing your um, content every single day, and while they're comparing your offers to your competitors' offers, it's very difficult for them to choose your competitors because they're, they're being educated constantly by what you're putting out. But same thing with your staff. Um, you're teaching your staff constantly about your brand, how to think. Uh, same thing about everyone in your network. Uh, with that, everyone that's seeing that social media, then for our business, we're a video company and a digital marketing agency. So if someone is talking about digital marketing in our network, I want the first thing in their mind to pop into their head, Visionary Digital Studios. Yeah, I know a company that does that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really a long, uh, a long game, I guess. It's, it's a front of mind awareness game. Um, but what you're saying is if you're doing it and your competitors aren't, then you're the one that's in front of them all the time. It's basically akin to, let's say Coke was advertising and Pepsi wasn't, no one's going to buy Pepsi. Yep. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. You're, you're the first thing that pops up into people's mind. Um, as long as that content is giving, it's very, very important. So the content um, has to be explaining some wisdom about your service. So if we're a marketing agency, um, every, every piece of marketing wisdom that we use in our projects, we've got in a piece of copy or what of anyway, that then goes out and educates our audience as they go. Yeah. Beautiful. Constantly uh, selling to your prospects and your existing customers without selling to them. Yep. 
exactly. I mean, it's, it's similar to the content we're producing right now, right? Yes, yes. For anyone who's watching, we're not trying to sell you anything, but maybe we are. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, um, I say this to our clients as well. I actually, like, I, I don't do anything sneaky at all. I know you guys don't either. All good marketing agencies um, work very authentically. So I'll actually, in our sales process, I'll actually tell our clients up front, okay, at the end of the project, there's going to be an upsell um, and it'll be this, this, and this. And then if, I mean, I, I can't remember anyone ever uh, complaining about being upsold, but if anyone ever says to me, uh, you're always trying to upsell. I would say uh, you don't want to work with a marketing agency that doesn't have the wisdom to be able to bring you new products and services all the time. Yeah, totally. And I always think about upselling and cross-selling in terms of if you don't offer those services, like those upsells to your client, maybe they actually want them. And if you don't offer them and they find out down the track, they could have got something that was of more value to them, even if it was more expensive they might actually be peeved about missing out on that opportunity. Yep. Or um, yeah, hundred percent. Even if they're not peeved, it's you have, you have not served them in the way that you could have. You've not given them as much as you could have. And I think that's a failure as a business owner. Uh, I know you think like that's very rare for marketing agencies to think that like that, but um, yeah, that's what, what I love about your business as well. You guys are always thinking like, how can I give value? How can I give value? It's awesome. Yeah, I think every every business can do it. Um, you know, even in the the cafe I used to have many moons ago, um, we'd train all the staff to, uh, you know, upsell to a bigger cup when they were ordering a cup of coffee, and it seemed really basic. But a lot of staff had this, you know, inbuilt fear of um, stealing an extra fifty cents or eighty cents from a customer by trying to upsell them to the the mug instead of the cup. And I always used to say, well, what if they didn't realize they can get a mug and they've been ordering in a cup and they really want the mug size. Um, if they don't want the mug, they can just say no. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's, you can tell the difference between, um, cafe is a great example. Uh, when you walk into a cafe, you can tell the difference between a, um, a cafe whose staff has been taught like that uh, in terms of, first of all, most cafes just don't even upsell, which is ridiculous. But uh, so when you walk into a cafe that's been trained to upsell and do it in a way that's all about how can I give the customer a better experience, you can tell it, it shows in everything that they do. Yeah. It's all about just getting, uh, you know, the most out of every customer that comes in the store as well, um, whether it's into your store or, or into your business. If you've already got that customer there in front of you, why not, you know, uh, help them with as many things as you possibly can rather than letting them, walk out the door or walk out of your business with, you know, the bare basics and then go and buy whatever else they need or want somewhere else anyway. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, what would you say is your greatest achievement in business so far? Greatest achievements. Uh, I think every time we, every time we launch a new product uh, is, is when I really feel could, really feel the most jubilation in business um, because I guess I don't, I don't know that many people realize how, how much effort goes into launching a new service or launching a new product and then delivering it at high quality from the very first customer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what comes to mind immediately. Um, we've done it quite a lot. I guess in my first few years of business, we delivered one product and um, that was it. And that was great. Like, like I, I love that too. Like, I think that's really wise in terms of like, uh, we got really, really good at that. Um, but then over the next few years after that, I started launching new products uh, and learned how hard that is to launch a new product to market. Um, but then also learned how satisfying it is, how glorious it is to launch a new product, deliver it to customers, have them delighted and then sit back and think, okay, cool. Wow. That's, we've conquered that one now. Now it's on to the next one. Yeah. That's really cool. How many different um, products do you actually have in the suite at the moment? Uh, we have many. So uh, we don't really have, uh, we don't really, have, we're not really a products business. We're more, uh, more a kind of um, prescriptive service. 
so we will do most things digital or if we don't uh, if we don't have that expertise or that skill set um, like Google Ads for example then we'll bring in um, experts which we do with you guys um, and then have them deliver that so uh, I suppose uh, yeah I guess we do most things digital agency wise as long as we have the expertise to understand it and as long as we have the skills the relationships to be able to deliver it yeah okay cool I actually thought that your answer to that was going to be something along the lines of um, you know being in corporate your whole life and then taking that that massive step because you literally quit your job overnight started a business um, bought a course was that right and started a business and here you are Correct. five years later um, you know kind of living the dream I guess but you've got employees everywhere and some fairly big scale projects going on with clients too yeah uh yes so uh, like I, I don't want to say it's all um spectacular there's like there's an equal caliber of problems there but um in terms of uh, five years ago working in the cor corporate world no idea about business and life was okay it was just lukewarm whatever um, but i had this dream this like crazy crazy dream and i, I was just like I don't think I can ever achieve it, but like, it would be amazing if I could do this, if I could build a business and um, have my own, like have my own values and put my own products out in the world and build my own team, not have to follow the, the processes and the, um, the values of a big behemoth company. But I never thought it was possible, you know? And uh, yeah. So every day, mate, I like, I, make sure I take some time. My balcony over here looks out over the ocean and I make sure I just take some time to be like, this is, I, I'm just so grateful. I'm just, just lucky, you know, I had the right things go for me and met the right people and yeah, it feels good. Made the right decisions, I think. Made the right decisions, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. But, but you know, like, uh, mate, I mean, you, you would say the same. We talk about this a lot. It has been an epic, epic journey. It's been some incredible incredible terrible lows and um you know most days i'm living my wildest dreams so life is good yeah those lows and those learning moments i think they're the things that uh you know make you stronger in business and uh and improve the business at the end of the day yeah it, it's amazing how um wise how intelligent you have to get in that way in, like in the business way in terms of um it's amazing how your mindset has to evolve and transform to run a business uh you know, in the corporate world, I was, I was running tech teams and I thought, I thought that I was intelligent. Um, and then the business world just smashes you up first couple of years. You realize like it just tears your ego down and, um, you know, you realize <laughs> that you got to lift your game if you want to succeed. I, I think business does that no matter what, even now. Um, I mean, I'm good. I, I've achieved my goals. I'm doing good, but business tears me down often, quite often. It just, tears me apart makes me realize like i ain't nothing i've got a long way to go i think that'll be like that for the rest of my life well no one successful um that you know hasn't had those learning moments and, and a few failures along the way so i think that's kind of uh it's just part of the course in running a business eh? yeah it's been what's been really profound for me is um to see some of my mentors or some um some of the business owners that i look up to whether it be in social media in the public space or personal friends or mentors that I have to see them go through like real hardship and really tough times, even though they have unlimited amounts of wealth, it's made me realize that it never stops. I don't think the journey is ever going to stop. Um, even if you've got unlimited money, there's different challenges and different problems. Definitely. I think running a business is a little bit like uh, being a professional skateboarder. Um, you're never going to be a professional skateboarder unless you take some pretty bad slams and then after the worst slams, get yourself back up and start skating again. Um, being in business is kind of the same. You've got to take a few slams and then, you know, sit back, figure out what went wrong and, and, uh, you know, fix the next attempt. I like it. Let's take that analogy a step for, for further. It's like being a UFC fighter and, and not one of those ones that wins 13 fights in a row either. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think I'd rather have learning moments in business than uh, in the UFC ring, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I don't know. There's been times where I'd probably rather be in the UFC, but there you go. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so tell us who's your dream customer. Like if you could work with any person or any business um, to provide the services that you provide now to them, who would it be? Okay. Um, well, I hate being a cliche. This is like the worst, uh, the worst thing for me, but I'm just going to be a super cliche. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Tesla, Elon Musk. Uh, I guess I guess almost every entrepreneur would say that, but the reason is because um, our target market is tech CEOs and specifically visionary tech CEOs who are looking to make global impact. We've got that really well defined. Um, so that is Elon Musk is the epitome of that, right? Um, but I, I, I guess I'm just saying what every entrepreneur would say in that I love that guy because he, he sets these. Uh, impossible missions these impossible goals and then you watch him just step by step achieve it get over these insurmountable problems it's beautiful to watch uh so consequently um i i am very indoctrinated in everything that is the tesla brand it's just beautiful their design is so spectacular everything they do is so high tech everything's industry leading it's like it's cutting edge in a way that we haven't seen before uh so i'd love elon musk to be our customer, uh, Elon, if you're watching, we're coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> what I really like about your answer there wasn't that you just, uh, you know, said a big name, um, but it was more that you sort of broke down, you want to work with Elon Musk because the people who would resonate with him are also your target market customers. That's probably something that people never think about when, you know, when thinking, who would I love to deal with? Um, you know, people say, oh, I'd love to have Richard Branson as a customer. Um, but, you know, the, the why behind why do you want Richard Branson as a customer? And is there, a, you know, a bigger reason, a bigger benefit to your business and a benefit that you can provide to other people out of having him as a customer? I think that's what you just broke down there is this, you've, you've really defined your target market, you know, who your sort of customer avatar is. And you know that that customer avatar would be accessible through somebody like Elon Musk. Yeah, man, definitely. Uh, something, one of the most profound lessons I learned in the mastermind is that uh, the understanding your um, target audience so powerfully, so well, that everything in your business is designed specifically for them. I think that's a really powerful concept. I find with our clients, uh, I guess, our clients aren't marketers. Um, they're often IT companies, tech companies. So when they come to us, it's, it's often really surprising to me. They don't, they don't really know who their target audience is or they know it from a very high level. Um, and they're, they are often very surprised at the level of questions. It's almost like an interrogation that we ask to understand what's going through their target market's mind so that we can design marketing that um, really kind of makes their audience feel that, that feeling in their chest, like, man, I need to work with this business. Yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. Really unique too. Thank you. Uh, so what's a, um, uh, like a professional development uh, or business book that you've read that has, you know, changed your life and changed your, your outlook on how you run your business? I love that. I love books. Uh, so many, man. So many. Uh, well, yeah, like every like every digital agency owner, um, always reading five books at a time. Uh, so I'd say uh, in the early days, like I'm going to say um, books like Grant Cardone, um, 10x Rule, and um, Be Obsessed or Be Average. Those those types of books really transformed my mindset from that kind of corporate thinking of like just getting the minimal done and getting it done to uh, 10x thinking or um, having to think so big and then having to make plans and go through evolution so big that it scares you. Um, that sort of thing was really powerful. Books by MJ DeMarco, um, his book Unscripted completely almost deprogrammed my mind over a few listens. Um, but I guess in terms of favorites, now I'm reading a, a lot more esoteric type books. So I'm just obsessed with a book at the moment called Reality Transurfing. I'm pretty sure I've talked to you about it as well. I've probably read it about 15 times. Um, 
It's mm -hmm. by a physicist uh, from Russia. And it talks about uh, creating goals based on energy, based on your energy and based on your way of being in the world. Uh, so that is, yeah, it's very, very powerful for me. Um, I suppose I'm going to say that if you've been exposed to esoteric concepts and you like that sort of thing, if you like that sort of law of attraction um, style content, then I cannot recommend that book highly enough for business owners because um, it's written by a, a, a physicist. So an epic scientist, uh, it kind of satisfies your logical mind and that spiritual side of things. Uh, yeah. And that book is just making profound impacts in every area of my life right now. Oh, wow. Okay. My uh, personal favourites uh, was The Goal by Eli Goldrath. Have you read that? Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. I can't believe we've never talked about this, man. That's arguably, if we're going to talk just business books, maybe that is probably my favourite as well. Yeah, it's funny. Um, I only thought about it then when I asked you the question and then I thought to myself, what's my favourite? And uh, it's that's one of those books that I wish I'd read when I was 20. Um, oh, yeah. Tell me why. Why why do you love it so much? Um, it changed the way that I thought about systemization and efficiency. Um, so like really building efficient processes in a business uh, and just how much you can add to the bottom line by, you know, creating efficient systems, running inventory in an intelligent way. Um, and I feel like it's applicable to almost every type of business as well. Um, yep. And every single area of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read it when I was 32 or 33, I think, um, and uh, was running a business at that point and made instant changes in the business that wow. were, were massive benefit um, and just saw us being able to basically produce more with uh, less man hours at the end of the yeah. day. Um, it, was, it was insane. You know? We had all these bottlenecks uh, in production and we were able to strip those out and, and literally pump out twice as much as what we were doing before with less staff. Um, I love it. Yeah. So love it's, it. totally that, thinking. It's, it's a very difficult book to get people to read. Um, and it's really frustrating for me because uh, that is, that book will change anyone's life if they read it, but it's just, uh, I don't know, I guess it hasn't got a very sexy title. It's like it's decades old right now. Um, so I guess it's difficult for people to read, but yeah, the goal by Elo Goldratt, uh, man, that was just life changing for me. Um, my mentor forced me to read it. Basically I was like, oh, I'll just read this rubbish cause I've been told to, um, yeah, change my life. I, I, I apply it every single day to every area of life, even to the point of, okay. Um, when I'm trying to evolve my health, I'll be thinking, okay, what's the bottleneck? Where, where should I focus? Yeah. Like, don't focus on anything else, just that, or my energy levels, my sleep. I did that recently. Where, where's the bottleneck in my sleep? Yeah. Um, man, yeah, I love that you mentioned that. Uh, if there's anything we could possibly do to convince anyone to read that book, do it. I think maybe the fact that it's uh, written in story format and it's actually pretty easy to read, like the it is. cover and the title is not attractive, but when you read it, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty stupid and I could get through that thing really easily because it was in that story format and it was actually really enjoyable. It was one of those books I just couldn't put down. Like I just wanted to keep on hammering through it. So completely agree. You know, it's so powerful about that as well. Uh, yeah, it's easy to read. And then once you've read it, you don't need to revisit it. Like it's the concept's super simple, but because it's in that story format, it just, uh, it embeds. I haven't read it again since I don't need to, it's easy for me now, but like, uh, yeah, it's just a powerful way of writing. Yeah, good book for anybody, even if you're not in a business, actually. Like, you can change the way that you, um, you know, prepare dinner at night mm -hmm. uh, with some of the principles from that thing. It's, uh, it's insane. Every problem should be tackled with theory of constraints. Yes. Every, every single problem. There, there is no problem that shouldn't be tackled with theory of constraints. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so um, before we wrap up, uh, What's something that you're yet to achieve in your business that you really want to nail? Ooh, uh, I want to, I mean, there's so many things. Uh, I don't want to say financial targets, got big financial targets, but like, but 
that really, I guess everyone has that sort of target. Um, so I want us to be running six figure humanitarian projects at some stage in the business. So it doesn't, uh, so we're a marketing agency, so it would need to be kept relevant to marketing. Um, but we could build digital presence or digital strategy for, um, perhaps global organizations that have some sort of humanitarian outlook or um, are doing some sort of uh, development activities in what I say is exotic countries. So I'm really interested in obviously India, that's my heritage or countries that um, perhaps in Africa or countries that I haven't visited so much, don't quite understand the culture so well, really interested in making big impact. Yeah. Um, so let's leave it at that. Uh, I guess I wasn't really prepared for that type of question. I love it. I'm going to say six figure projects in exotic countries that make a massive impact. Very cool. Very cool. That, um, that side of, of the business and your vision, I think is, is important. Um, something that when starting a business, I think often gets overlooked because people generally start a business with the aim of, probably making more money. Um, Surviving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's certain businesses that get started for, you know, reasons of wanting to improve a product, improve a service and, and do it better than it's ever been offered out there. Uh, and then there's, there's plenty, probably the overwhelming majority that get started because somebody wants to make more money than they were under their previous boss. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but I love having that. Yeah. That kind of humanitarian angle. That's very cool. I think um, I think you need to have your um, financial side of things satiated um, before you can really go all in on that um, humanitarian vision. I think like uh, everyone, certainly every business owner, um, is okay with having more money. Um, I certainly want more money. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I actually think I think it's a virtue. We can probably get into that another time. But um, but I think once you're like once you're not feeling lack in in your life and in your business, then um, then the focus can be on those kind of more virtuous goals. Yeah, yeah. You got to help yourself before you can help others. Exactly, agreed. It's just like when the uh, oxygen mask drops in the plane, you know, you've got to put your own on before you put the kids on. Yep, 100%, 100%. That, that lesson applies universally. So to the guy who runs a global cartoon company, if you could <laughs> Any cartoon character, who would you be and why? Oh, cartoon character. Um, I'm going to say, wow, okay. That's an intense question. I'm going to say Popeye because he's got big biceps. <laughs> <laughs> do you eat a lot of spinach? I do, actually. I do. I have a green shake packed with spinach every day. It's not really working for my biceps, though, but... Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to try something else. We we just did a um a project for a client that does international stem cell tours. So, um, if next time you see me, I have massive biceps. It's probably because I've been working with a stem cell company. Trialing the other uh, product. So, trialing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, business owners often, uh, you know, think about what their legacy is going to be, and sometimes people ask, you know, what's your legacy? What do you want to leave behind? I don't want to ask that question because it seems a bit too generic. So, oh, I'm so glad say, about that. when you're dead, what is just the one single word you want people to think of when they think about you? Visionary. That makes sense. <laughs> First thing that came to mind. I like it. Happy. Lock that answer in. Probably didn't need to ask that question actually. <laughs> I'm glad you did it. Uh, I, you know, I haven't thought about that. I'm just going to, uh, go on a bit of a tangent right now in that I don't, uh, I don't really, I'm not really concerned about being remembered at all when I die. Uh, the legacy thing isn't a thing for me. I, I just don't understand it. I don't really need to leave, leave a legacy. Um, I want to just make sure that uh, I guess I've lived all of my dreams now and uh, at the moment, like the only real dreams that I have is to make impact in the world. That's cool. That's cool. And uh, wrapping up, leave us with a quote. What's your favorite quote? A favorite quote, what you seek is seeking you from a uh, roomy 13th century mystic. Um, when that, the way that applies in business is if you really understand the purpose, the vision, the mission 
behind your business, if you really understand that properly at a real visceral level, then um, you like opportunities find you. They just they just pop up, and uh, it's it's very difficult to explain unless you've experienced it. But the opportunity will pop up, and you know instantly that cool, that's the opportunity. Even if you haven't signed contracts, even if you haven't negotiated, even if you haven't got anything, even if you haven't done any due, due, due diligence, um, you just know that, okay, that was the opportunity that's right for me and you're ready to go. What you seek is seeking you. Awesome, thank you. Um, it's been awesome chatting to you as always. And uh, do you wanna give yourself a quick plug? Uh, where do we find you on the internet and on social media channels? Uh, yeah, so if you are a tech company, you're looking to get your message found in the world, um, check out our website, visionarydigitalstudios.com. You'll have everything you need there. Excellent. Thanks, mate. Well, uh, very much appreciate you coming on and being asked uh, this barrage of questions uh, and answering so truthfully and uh, and with a lot of a lot of thought behind your answers as well. Um, very cool to, uh, to meet somebody who is uh, in a similar industry, in a similar place to me. We both live two kilometers away from each other. Um, and uh, you know, you've got such a cool vision and, uh, and so many amazing things you want to do with the business. So I uh, can't wait to, to see them all unfold over the next few years. Love it, Adam. Thanks a lot. Um, and I will add to close off, uh, I guess, I realized this as I was talking, this isn't prepared at all. I just, as I was answering a lot of these questions, I, I realized how much of the wisdom, how much of the knowledge that's coming out of me has come from you and has come from our conversations. So much respect for AdWords work and um, thank you for the wisdom and friendship. Yeah. Thank you, man. That's uh, it's very nice of you to say. I've stole it all from someone else. <laughs> me. <laughs>